All right, you hopped on the crazy train for cybersecurity. You got a Bitcoin billionaire Forrest here. All aboard. And you got crypto junkie Hef here. And actually, we have such a cool cool day planned for you guys to enjoy on this podcast. Now, as always, uh, we want you to hit the, the like button. To help us uh, help others. And that's what this is about. Because our, our podcast is really about helping people understand what's going on in the world of cyber security. And of course, if you're here for the Forest Soapbox, we'll get to that here in just a moment. But right, and you know, always subscribe. We love subscribers, and and just connect with us online too. If you have an idea or you have a comment, please uh, share that with us as well. We do have this wicked cool, wicked smart threat briefing email. I'm from the East Coast, folks, so uh, sometimes my Philly accent comes out pretty strong. But we do have this incredible threat briefing email. It's a subscription based. It, we we take the top stories, we curate them into a small little uh, post and you can subscribe to that but we are from security metrics yeah we help small to large businesses with access to affordable easy to use simple to use data security compliance tools and of course cybersecurity tools and Forrest we do have an exciting show I think I really want to hear your thoughts on some of these stories uh, but the top oh, stories oh, are boy. yeah I know the top stories are about patching this week tons of patches Forrest yep. I mean Patch a palooza, baby. Uh, it's never not patches. Oh if you're my. not patching, you're doing it wrong. No, my gosh, man. We're going to talk about that. The OWASP top 10, they have a new number one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Glad to see it. Yeah, man. And we're going to talk about hacking TV remotes. I can't believe this story is, is in the news. And I can. can. I definitely can. Yeah. I, I, I'm shocked, man. <laughs> who, who would thought? Who, why would you want to uh, uh, hack a TV remote? Uh, We're going to tell you why. And how likely is your employee to cause a data breach? We're going to give six tips. That's right, folks. Count them. Six tips for cybersecurity training for your small to medium-sized business. And then we'll uh, we'll wrap up the show with about Airbnb and Verbo hidden cameras, Forrest. Ugh. Oh, my gosh. It's uh, not the best. Hey, DJ, play that song, man. Yeah. All right, Forrest. I mean, the news has been flooded with just, I call, we call it a patch of palooza, but, yeah. but the number of vulnerabilities and patches available this past week. Basically, if you have any kind of electronic device, you probably need to patch it. What do you want to start with? You want to talk about the Apple patching, or you want to talk yeah. about the Android, Google y stuff? Yeah, let's let's start with with the Apple. All let's... right, what what could you tell the audience? Because uh, I know a lot of people love their Apple products. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's all over the news this past week. Urgent patch. Yeah, yeah. This actually goes back to uh, a story that we had talked about previously with the the Pegasus spyware yes. that was. Uh, um, Israeli developed and then being sold to various nation states and intelligence agencies and whatnot. At the time, they we didn't know there was a lot of speculation as to what the vulnerability was. Um, yeah. And uh, now that that it's fully patched, they they actually went ahead and Citizen Lab uh, disclosed what what vulnerabilities were involved with that. Um, and they're they're actually calling it um, forced entry. That's forced it. Entry. That's yes. a, that's yes. what they're calling the the vulnerability and. Uh, uh, essentially, it is a zero-click uh, uh, code execution that um, is is pretty nasty. Doesn't require any user interaction whatsoever. Uh, it's done through uh, the messages application, and uh, it's my understanding that it it saves a uh, what is a looks like a GIF file, uh, but actually contains PDF code. Um, and wow. through that there, they found, a, uh, an exploit in the PDF handling, uh, that, that allows it to completely bypass that blast door sandbox. So, um, wild, wild. Yeah. And, and for us, this vulnerability and folks, you really do need to patch if, if you have an iPhone, if you have an iPad, if you've got an iPod touch, if you got those yeah. fancy Apple watches, everybody loves their Apple watch. Yeah, you got to get out there and patch. So that's the big one on the Apple side of the house. Yeah. And then for us, let's switch gears. I was shocked, man. Shocked, but not shocked. Okay. <laughs> uh, 11 zero days for the year for Google. And they just yeah. added two more. Yep. So you got to patch your Google stuff. 40 vulnerabilities were patched this past week just for Google, for yep. Google stuff. You got to get out there, folks, and get on that. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's it it is a, a lot going on, and that's uh you know applies to Chrome OS as well. One thing I did want to bring up was um, more CVEs did, does not necessarily mean more vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, it just means that they've found more. Uh, so I mean that could be proportional to the amount of attention that's being paid to it. 
I mean, there's there's a lot of fighting online as to, you know, is is Chrome uh, more secure in their uh, in their security modeling, or do they just have more people? Writing patches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a good call out for us. Yeah. I would I would caution everyone too. I mean, you really have to do do your research before you roll out any patch in your environment. You gotta make sure it's the right patch. You gotta make sure you do your due diligence in your environment that it doesn't break things. So I, I can't tell you the number of times that people say, Oh, I'm just gonna roll out this patch just because it's ready, and the next thing you know, their whole network goes down. So make sure your staff does their due diligence on these uh, these patches. So the other thing for us in the news is Microsoft putting out a bunch of patches. But it wasn't just Microsoft, man. It was Adobe, Citrix, Fortinet. I mean, tons of just, you got to know what appliances you have in your environment and you've got to just be on top of this. But let's talk about the Microsoft stuff for just a moment. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, they they did release some patches yesterday. So that's, uh, that's good. Um, the, the one that jumped out to me was the, the MS HTML. Yes. Uh, right. apparently the, the root of this goes back to, uh, malicious active X controls. Like I, I saw that and I was just like, <laughs> wait a minute, Take me what back. year is it? <laughs> Hold up. Like, wait a minute. Something ain't right. It's, uh, like, like <laughs> active X hasn't had a release since like 2013. <laughs> Like it's a chuckle. It's moment. it's been dead for eight years yeah. and yet it's still coming to rear its ugly head. Like I, I really do have to wonder how much legacy code Microsoft has from like 3.1 or NT. <laughs> like like how much of that is still kicking around. I mean, even three years ago they were still using the same font uh right. handling framework. It, it's it's I don't know. But forced, I mean these patches they come out before the patches came out, the mitigation was just block ActiveX controls. And I'm thinking, I thought we had already gotten rid yeah, of this, yeah. <laughs> but no. So the patch is available for this MS HTML protocol. Um, and again, these zero dates, these zero day exploits, not only for the Windows, but for the Mac and Google, a lot of this stuff is all being actively exploited right now. So just get on top of this stuff. But you know, the Microsoft uh, b- patches for us, it wasn't just for MS HTML, the zero day bug. But it was also for Print Nightmare. Finally, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Third, third time's a charm. Yeah, I don't know. Time. We'll get we'll, on top. We'll of that. see. Oh man, we're not jaded at all around here, oh, folks. Man. No, not bitter. Glass not is not least. half full or half empty, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, pessimistic, optimistic. Uh, it, I don't know. Man. Info Infosec is perpetual. The sky is falling. It is. So, it is. Yeah. And we're just trying to avoid burnout. I mean, and that's the joy of doing this podcast, folks. It just it helps us avoid burnout. It allows us a chance to just disconnect from the week and. And just talk about what the heck is going on out there in the world. Speaking of what the heck is going on out there in the world, Forrest, this uh, where is the remote? I laughed. Oh, uh, I don't know if we man. can put up a screenshot of this, uh, director, but where is is an old school term for hacked software, for pirated software. Yep. That's W-A-R-E-Z. Where's the remote? Where is the remote? A, a, a vulnerability. I, I didn't pick up on the pun until this morning, and I was like, oh. Uh-huh. I couldn't stop laughing on this <laughs> pun. So that's what the researchers called it. And what it's referring to, folks, is this. Uh, if you have a Comcast Xfinity service, specifically if you have the remote known as the XR11, which is a voice remote, uh, it has a vulnerability where the the uh, audio can be recorded. Now, the incoming RF packets into the remote control are actually encrypted. What the scared part is, is the, the, the response is when they leave the remote, who could intercept them for like a man in the middle type of attack? Yeah, yeah. It looks like it's uh, it's as part of the firmware update process is what they're actually exploiting, which yes. is really interesting. Yeah. Um. I. I. Yeah. So so far they've reported a a sixty five foot range to be able to reliably uh, do this, but they also said we haven't pushed this to the limit yet. So, wow. um. You know. W- once again, I mean, we had just mentioned what last last episode was yeah, was I think we, uh, did. we talked about that my my rant on on smart, smart devices yes. and yeah i mean at, at this point i feel like you ever you ever see that uh simpsons where it has abraham simpson on the <laughs> on the newspaper old man yells at cloud yeah. i feel i feel like that's starting to to be me at this point like am i am i just tilting at windmills am i You're am i don Quixote yeah. over here <laughs> maybe, maybe i should just give up and just I- embrace it you no, know no don't don't ever give up for us we know. need more cyber combat warriors man <laughs> there is a patch available for this remote again it's comcast it affects anybody that's on their service there 
real concern, though, is, you know, future exploitation of other remotes and being able to record conversations. So just keep it on your radar. If it doesn't impact you, it's just something to know about. And we, we find it fascinating here at the SM Newscast. So leave a comment, though. We'd like to hear your comments. I mean, if, how do you what do you think about this? Uh, this this hacking of TV remotes? It's uh, it's pretty wild. <laughs> All right, switching gears. We are going to talk about something. I I love this subject. I love the OWASP Top Ten. Oh, OWASP and, is an amazing organization. And we're not developers. Yeah, we're not developers. But that organization for us, it's so worth being a member of their organization just to understand all of the vulnerabilities out there. And and what's going on right now, folks, is OWASP puts out a top ten ranking of the top ten. Uh, basically software vulnerabilities out there. So if you're a developer, what should you be looking at and what should be your priority when it comes to finding and fixing your code? So they have this list and it's in draft form right now for an update. And what's really cool is after 10 years, we're finally getting an update for us. And you want to share and tell the audience a surprise? Yeah. Surprise, yeah. surprise. Uh, yeah. Um, so at this point, the new number one, uh, has become uh, broken access controls. So yeah. Uh, yeah, whether that's permissions or whatever. So they they generally uh, have these broad categories under which they'll have you know several different specific vulnerabilities. They're they're just going for more the the overall classification. Their website is an amazing resource. If yeah. you're a web dev, highly recommend checking it out. It's it's an encyclopedia of all kinds of amazing examples, cheat sheets, mitigations. It's how to secure your environment exactly from, yeah. from a software and application standpoint. So when we're talking about broken access control here, we're talking about threat actors bypassing access control checks. And they could do that by modifying the URL. They could do it by internal application states or even uh, modifying your HTML page, even sometimes using a custom API attack tool. So the concern is if they break your 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 and broke your access control what could they do once they're in your environment and there's a lot of um, it's really hard to detect it's really hard to find these weaknesses it's, it can't really be done through automation it has to oftentimes be done through manual checks in your code uh, and it, it's it's a difficult thing to find yeah most definitely um, I also wanted to call out the the number two. Oh, okay. Uh, which is cryptographic failures. Yeah. And I have been seeing a lot of this. Um, it's it's amazing how uh, how many organizations are still using even SSL. Yeah. Like, it's been deprecated for how long now? Like, yeah, uh, SSL shouldn't even be in your environment. It should be TLS or bust. And, yeah, you still see TLS 1.0. You still see 1.1. You know, 1.2 yeah. is, you know... Yeah, acceptable, you know, it's, um, but the, the NSA puts out a guide uh, on, on proper con properly configuring uh, your TLS so that you have that uh, strong cryptographic protection. Um, yeah, highly recommend checking that out if, if you have any kind of TLS in your environment. So what we, uh, we hopefully will have put up a screenshot here of what the 2017 OWASP Top 10 looks like and what the proposed 2021 looks like. So you get an idea. And again, if you're not a developer, it's okay. It's good to learn about these items and, and know what you may be asking when you have an audit come through your environment and you want to know those types of things that an auditor might be looking for, So or a developer for that matter. Yeah. Uh, one one other special shout out yeah. I wanted to make real quick. Bring it, uh, bring it for us. Number six, uh, vulnerable and outdated components. Ah, Patch yeah. your stuff. Yeah. Uh, and number nine, I might be a bit biased on this one, but security and monitoring failures. Uh, just what, not doing it yeah, at all. What you what you can't see, you you can't know. So yeah, yeah be be watching out for that. All right, Forrest, uh, you know, this this story caught my attention and I wanted to talk about it. It's it's Ooh, Mozilla yeah. and they released a new version of Firefox back on August 10th. And yeah. what Mozilla was able to do is actually reverse engineer the way that Microsoft uh, sets up Edge as your default browser inside Windows 10. And I love. I love this kind of story for us because a lot of people don't like Microsoft Edge. Yeah. They're like vehemently against whatever it is, Microsoft, we're not going to have it in our environment. Yeah, yeah. And and they just continue to try and, and <laughs> push it. it. Yeah. The, so in first and foremost, good for Mozilla. Yeah. Like yeah. awesome. I love that they did this. 
it's amazing. I like, thought you would like this story. Oh yeah, Tr- trying to change your default browser in Windows 10 was a joke. It's like it's okay, impossible. I, I from within my browser, yeah, I want to make you the default, and then it's like okay, it takes you to this this other menu, and it's like oh, unless you scroll down, you don't see it. And you scroll down, you click it, you change the browser, and it's like, but are you really sure? No, no. Are you really because, sure? Because guess what's gonna happen for us? The next time you install an update or do something like that, it's gonna ask you again. We're gonna take back control. What, you know what's even crazier is in Windows 11 in the previews that we've been seeing they've broken out the default browser into like 11 different permissions or different file types that you need to associate. So yeah. if you want to change, fully change your default browser, you have to go through and select a different browser on 11 different entries. Oh. Like what a dark pattern. Yeah. What what a jerk. Sh- it's shady. Like, it's, it's, it's really yeah. shady for us. And I get it. You know, it's their operating system. It's their house, their rules. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's a, cons- it's a customer that's going to drive the business. And if yeah. your browser is not what the market wants, then you're going to have, you're going to be forced as a c- consumer, as a creator of this product to improve upon it. So. Yeah. All right, Forrest, you know, this is another topic that's near and dear to me is the question came up in an article, how likely is your employee to cause a data breach? And what are your thoughts on a scale of one to 10? Oh, I I think uh, humans, uh, you know, it's the the old adage, humans are always going to be the weakest link in your security. Um, And and I I think that's probably going to hold true. I mean, I'm I'm trying to... uh, not spoil it. But. No, 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 not at all. But the Verizon, they put out this DBIR report every year. They just recently put it out. I think we covered it in a previous podcast. I don't remember, but they did say a number. They said 85% of data breaches have a human aspect. Yeah. What I find fascinating is in the in their research report that we read, and we'll include the article in the link here, but trained employees perform only marginally better than untrained perf- uh, employees on cybersecurity tests. So no, many of you have cybersecurity training, security awareness type stuff out there. And what the article highlighted was how important it is for helping people remember those concepts. And when you talk about this thing called the Abenhaus forgetting curve, mm, I, I'm going to yeah. say that again. We're getting all scientific. I'm putting on my professor cap here, all right? <laughs> the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. It shows that humans forget approximately 50% of all new information within an hour of learning of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, I know we here at Security Metrics, we have our own training platform and we we have like 30, we have a catalog, folks, of like 34,000 training courses available for our customers. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, how much information is that? That's a lot of information for humans to try to assimilate. Yeah. And for most people, Forrest, they can only remember about six to nine data points. Yeah, yeah. And the the retention falls off even further. I think it drops down to like something like 20% after about 30 days. So it's... Wow. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, the, the human element, I, I like how they broke that down. It was about uh, 50% of that, that 85 was fishing uh, yeah. of some kind. Uh and then the other portion was like social engineering. Um, so yeah, it's a, a, a good breakdown of, of uh, what things you really should be trying to focus on in your security training. Um, again, with that, that uh, retention period, I think the, the key is going to be repetition. Yeah. Uh, just having that in the forefront of, of people's minds and keeping it fresh on a consistent basis. And that's what the article highlighted too, is the feedback element. So, you know, for, for many of you, your employees go through this cybersecurity training and th- for many of them, it's just, oh, it's just a check the box. I'm just doing it for compliance reasons. You know, oh, we're done with it for another year. But really the feedback has to be constant. And what the researchers discovered and shared was that it typically takes 18 to 254 days for that information to become a habit. So when you're talking about changing your employees' behavior and making them more uh, thinking about cybersecurity and cybersecurity awareness in their environment, it has to be constant. It can't be overwhelming. The content can't be too many data points to try to get them to remember. And it has to be a, a constant ongoing process. So to that BMAY, uh, Forrest, I, there was a good quote that came out and it was a six cybersecurity training best practices. And we want to take a quick moment to help for specifically for our small to medium sized businesses that struggle with this. The quote Forrest was in this article and the researcher said that there's this 
common misperception, miscon uh, perception, conception. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. There's a common misconception that SMBs aren't aware of cybersecurity threats. And I got to tell you, Forrest, in my experience, I want to hear you too. I don't really see that as the issue. I see it as more. It's they're unsure sometimes what to do about all these threats because sometimes these threats can be overwhelming. And that's where the challenge came. It's not that they're not aware of it. It's just they sometimes struggle of what do I do with it once I find it in my environment? Yeah, yeah. A lot of these places, it's like, oh, well, I've, I've got an IT guy that I consult, uh, you know, whenever we need something. This is this is his job, his responsibility kind of thing. And it's like, mm, not so much. Yeah. Like, you know, or, or people think, uh, you know, this this doesn't, like, I'm not, I'm not a target. Yeah. Um, and we're and, too small to be a target. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I mean, the yeah, reality it, is the bad guys are going to find value in whatever you have in your environment. Yeah. And you may not think it's valuable, but to them, they will find that value and be able to sell it on I the mean, dark web. I mean, even an idle computer is still, you know, invaluable to them in some way, whether it's a botnet or crypto mining or leeching your bandwidth, as we have discussed yeah. time and time again in the past. So, so this article said six uh, cybersecurity training best practices. And we wanted to very quickly highlight them for you in the audience here. And again, it applies to enterprises or SMBs. This article was specifically written for small to medium sized businesses. The first question they brought up is defining what exactly is cybersecurity awareness in your environment and for many organizations they don't even know what risks they have in their environment so that could be a struggle is it is it phishing that is a, a primary threat to your business or is it something completely else is it denial of service is it uh, uh, ransomware so you have to kind of define that before you you go on this pathway what risks matter most to the business yeah so the second thing that this article highlighted was understanding uh, an SMB's prior awareness about cybersecurity. So this even goes further back for us. Before you even introduce training into your environment, it's about understanding the attitudes of your, your employees, the behaviors of your employees. What are they doing? Are they actually clicking on fishes or is it not really a risk? right now based on your business? Or is it simply you have a lot of old logins in your environment and you've never gotten rid of those old logins, those ghost logins? So yeah. you gotta really know what it is is the priority. The third thing that the article highlighted was avoiding taking a one size fits all approach. And we see this a lot with businesses, especially these medium to small size businesses, which is making the lessons are irrelevant, they're generic. So, you know, you, you, you buy this cybersecurity training or awareness platform and it's articles and stories and things that don't apply to your business. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're just going down this this checklist yeah. of, of, you know, fill out this worksheet kind of thing. It's like, okay, like how, you know, there's, there's I think there lacks a connection there between, okay, here's this application that we use in-house like, how can we tie that into this training? Into the training, yes. Yeah. And you know where you see this a lot, Forrest, is I, I love when our audience joins us on these calls and the, on, on these podcasts because we try to connect the newest, latest cybersecurity threats and try to explain it in such a way that it can connect back to your business. And hopefully you can make that that connection as well. But Forrest, I mean, it's it's something like last the last episode we did. You remember what we talked about? That phishing campaign that they were using, the bad guys were using... Oh, the, the copyright. Uh, yeah, yeah. DMCA notices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the kind of you're not going to see that in your training program because it's it's a training module. You you've uploaded to your environment, but where we would find that information is listening to a podcast like us, where we'll tell you, hey, look out for this in your environment. If you get not only an IRS notification, yep. but one of these fake. Google uh, DMCA copyright notifications. Uh, let your team members know. Put that on an advisory every week, every week. Put out some of the stuff that you're learning from these podcasts. So, all right, there, there's three others, and we got to move on here, right? The other one is making no room for fear, and I thought this was number four on their list. There's there's strong evidence that if you put too much fear into your cybersecurity training, that it turns people off. Yeah. And we we absolutely agree with that statement. We try not to put any kind of fear in our work. It, for us, it's 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 another day at the office and we're going to try to protect our clients. It's more about empathy 
for the human condition. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, trying to employ the the carrot versus the stick yes. kind of thing. You know, yeah. it's it's not so much uh, if you click this, you've failed. It's if you report this, you've succeeded. Yes. You know, yeah. like like have a competition, have a little, you know, a, a scoreboard or yeah. something, you know, like number of phishing emails reported. Like, yeah. I don't know, just, just trying to find a, a way to spin that in a positive light. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, you see that sometimes in some businesses where if you failed and you clicked on the fish multiple times, the employee gets fired. There's some businesses out there that actually do that, folks. Yep. And it, the question is, is it is it counterproductive? Is it ineffective in changing long-term behavior if people are fearful? So uh, changing that approach and you get different uh, you get different results. So there were two more. And that was uh, the, the second one was creating an ongoing and non-intrusive training program, which means it should not be information overload. Yeah. It should be, it should not be complex. Cybersecurity forest, in my opinion, is extremely complex. Oh yeah. I know we try to, we try to simplify it as much as possible here on the podcast. I, I try to explain things that my mother can understand it. If my mom can understand it, then I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I, I have a tendency, unfortunately, to do some, <laughs> some deep dives on some things, but well, you're the color I mean, commentator guy. Yeah, so it's okay. Yeah. Above all, uh, try to make it small, Try to make it digestible and try to make it repeatable because, again, that repetition is going to keep things fresh in their minds. So, yeah, yeah just, uh, uh, you know, a little bite-sized pieces, you know. And, and, again, I would challenge you all to connect it back to the real world. So as new stories come up that may potentially impact your environment, uh, this new type of fish came out. Share that with your team. So the last thing is they, they recommend in this article – uh, measuring the effectiveness. And absolutely, it's all about measuring. And when you have that measurement, then you can go back and say, look at the progress that we've made. Look at the 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 mountains that we've climbed. And you can measure things in a variety of ways from with cybersecurity awareness, self-assessments, quizzes, behavioral observation. Forrest mentioned gamification of your environment and compliance monitoring. All that stuff is a great way to, to measure the environment. So there yep. it is, folks. Six ways that you can make cybersecurity more engaging and more uh, effective in your environment. There were some really wicked, I mean, wicked breaches, Forrest. Uh, yeah. The one that really ha caught my attention was the United Nations one, because oh, yeah. it's not the first time these people have been no, told. No, no. It's, uh, yeah, this is what, fifth one in the last three, four years? Easily, I mean, it's, easily. yeah. Easily, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's funny how even this breach follows a lot of the trends that we've been seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it appears to have originated from credentials that were purchased off the dark web. So, yep. you know, just somebody had some credentials that were being shared between, uh, you know, home logins or other logins that had been breached elsewhere. Yeah. And then they were able to pivot into their environment using that. And the environment that they pivot into, they have this proprietary project management software. So the bad guys use those credentials, got in through there, and then access the network. And as we know in multiple episodes of this show that we've talked about, once the bad guys do their recon, they get into the environment, they start to move laterally, they find something of value, and then they move to the next part, which is command and control and data exfiltration. They follow that kill chain. So what I found interesting for us about the United Nations is is multiple private cybersecurity experts have warned them oh, yeah. over and over again in recent months. Yeah, yeah. This one was was really uh, kind of face palm moment. Uh, you know, they they had initially said, oh, it, it was only screenshots that yeah. that they got, and then. Um, I'm trying to remember the the name of the company, Resecurity. I, I think, think. Like uh, they're like, you know, lol, no, uh, here's some proof otherwise. And then UN just stopped communicating with them. They, yeah. they just left the chat. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's move on. That's yeah. that's not how you respond to these kinds of things. It's 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 uh, disheartening and multiple use cases, folks. We're talking January of 2020. The Geneva and the Vienna offices, the UN offices, were popped. We go back as far back as 2018. Chinese uh, they were intercepted EU diplomatic cables. Yeah. I mean, guys, this just keeps going on with this organization. Yeah. When are they going to learn? I mean, okay. there was there was also 2018. The Russians um, they they hacked the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Yeah. Uh, 2019, uh, their their SharePoint was breached. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just time and again they just keep getting hit with this. I mean, granted, nation states are hard to defend against, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, they they do need to have the the proportional uh, kind of defense measures uh, to counteract that, but. Um, I mean, you know, when you've got attackers in your environment for four months, 
uh, you know, in, in the fifth time in the last four years, like there's, there's, there's some gaps there. Yeah. Another breach in the news right now is this McDonald's monopoly, which I love. I love talking about monopoly, the game. It's a fun game for us, but the UK version of the game, they had a bug in their software. So their login names and their passwords for the game's database. It wasn't their primary production database though. It was their, like their setup database. Yeah, the staging. Yeah. The yeah. staging database that got popped. And, uh, the bad, the, the good guy, one of the, the guys that got the email from them said, Hey, um, I, you know, I think I, I got access to the winning codes as well. So he did he did ethically disclose back to McDonald's, and they did change the password to the staging database. Yeah. But he was only able to get as far as what the firewall rules would allow him. So he wasn't yeah. able to get into the production yeah, database. Yeah. Supposedly firewalled off, uh, thankfully. Um, seeing the the screenshot that they included uh, was was pretty. Uh, pretty incredible. Just right there, body of text is just this this SQL error, yeah. uh, just dumping uh, username, password right there in plain text. Oh, and, and he was able to get access to all like the the database parameters and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So that's some dangerous stuff. Out yeah, there, folks. yeah. So it it all. I mean, th this thing even made it onto TikTok. Like, <laughs> ouch. Um, yeah. Uh, and really, it, it came down to a, an exception error, right? Um, it, it, you know, it, it threw this exception and caused it to all get printed out. Um, I guess the lesson learned there is uh, if you're if you're a database admin, always use prepared statements um, and always use try catch, you know, yeah, uh, try and, and prevent those those exceptions from, uh, you know, getting getting out. I mean, I, I would say that's a valuable lesson for any web dev. Big time. All right, so folks, this McDonald's breach is unbelievable, but there's another one that you need to be aware of, and that is 60 million wearable fitness tracking records were exposed via another unsecured database. Forrest, it's like, uh, oh, have we man. heard this song, same song and dance, yeah, man? Yeah, Come on. It's, uh, it's rather frustrating. Uh, yeah. So the vendor is Get Health, and what the, the bottom line is, if you've ever used Ven uh, Get Health, it's a platform that can pool all your health-related data and, and pull it from multiple sources together. So if you have like Fitbit or if you have Misfit wearable or if you have like a, a Google Fit or a Microsoft Band or Strava, any of that stuff, all that data is being included on the Get Health website, which has been exposed. 61 million records, Forrest. It's a yeah. lot of data. GLIP yeah. data, G GPS data. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of stuff that, that goes in there. I mean, once again, uh, smart devices, you know, strike again. Uh, and, and a lot of this, uh, it, it kind of underscores a, a bigger trend that I'm starting to see where, you know, this, this idea of, of, uh, what I like to call surveillance capitalism yeah. is starting to make its way into, uh, things that are health related. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, no, sir, I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I see the value in the devices, but are there any of these kinds of devices that, that respect their users and their privacy? No, I mean, there's none for us. But you, you imagine the scare. Like if, if you're a celebrity or you're somebody that has a, an important job title, right, and you go for runs every day around a certain park or you're doing the same pathway, all that data that's being tracked, and now it was on the Get Health website, and now who knows who's purchasing that data. Yep. Um, it's, it's scary stuff for yeah, us. You, it really is, man. You saw a similar problem not too long ago where uh, Fitbits were uh, leaking location and uh, movement data yeah. based on like troop training routines. Oh, the military. I remember that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. were running around, you know, doing their rounds around the camp and it's like, oh, this is, this is all getting tracked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Scary, man. Scary. Yep. If so, so what can you do about it? Obviously you need to research and, and read about your, the privacy statement and you need to check your settings. The challenge that, that Get Health has is all the files that were leaked. They show the data, how the blueprint is for how the network operates. So they're in some real trouble folks. And, uh, and I feel for all of you that had your data stored on Get Health's website, it's some some nasty stuff. Yeah. I know I know a lot of people love Airbnb, and gosh, you know I don't like Airbnb or Verbo specifically because of this hidden camera stuff. I've never I've never been a fan of it, Forrest. And do you absolutely use any of these things? Um, I I don't personally have uh, Airbnb uh, accounts. I I definitely have friends and family that that use it. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh it's it's a weird area where it's like you're you're going into somebody else's house kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I I definitely uh like the hotel approach uh, a lot more, but I can see why why people would opt for it. I mean, imagine if you are staying in an Airbnb or Verbo and you find a kin, kin camera. It's not just a negative experience. But it's also a violation of the terms of service, and it can even be a criminal act. Yeah. I mean, that, that on top of it. And Forrest, what, what's challenging with Airbnb when you read their terms of service is their rules, um, they have to be followed, and the hosts have to follow these rules, and the disclosure rules are not consistent between these services. So when and where they disclose where the camera's located at or if they even have cameras in their environment, that's the challenge right now. Because uh, Forrest, a lot of these people... These hosts, they can just show you a camera in the listing photo and they've met the definition. They could just say it in the safety features or the amenities section. Oh, we have cameras for your protection. All right, we, we install these cameras. Yeah, yeah. And in my opinion, uh, internal cameras shouldn't even be necessary. No, not um, at all. I mean, it's going to be pretty evident if they're breaking things or stealing stuff, uh, whatever. You know, they, they make the argument, well... Uh, we need to be able to see how many people are staying there. And it's like, well, you can still determine that with an external camera, any camera that's watching entrance exit. Why, like, come on. Like, do you yeah. really do you really need uh, to, to be able to, to watch what people are doing inside? But I have to protect my property, man. I mean, ab above all, like, creeper's going to creep, right? Like, you know, uh, people aren't going to... Um, if, if somebody is, is uh, scummy enough to do this, they're not going to care about terms of service. Maybe they'll care about, you know, uh, getting charges pressed, but yeah. uh, I don't know. Uh, in in my opinion, yeah, a lot of these are, are operating off of Wi-Fi. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you particularly paranoid about running into these devices, maybe uh, if you do have access to the wireless router, you know, disconnect it. Maybe bring your own router that you can yeah. hook up if you really do need Wi-Fi there. So, so before we get too deep into lessons learned and what you can do about it, and that's a good point, unplug the Wi-Fi router. I, I got to share a story with you. And the story is I, I had a friend who stayed in a, in a Verbo, I believe it was, and she brought a dog with her, and the dog was not permitted. They were not allowed to have mm -hmm. animals in the Verbo. Yep. And she didn't know that there were cameras inside the house. And she gets a text, an email from the owner of the, ho the host. And he says, hey, uh, I noticed you had a pet. And she's like, um, how? How did you know that I had a pet? And come to find out, the security cameras were installed in the the, the, the smoke detectors mm. and that's how they found. So the, the rooms had two smoke detectors and that was like her warning sign. Like, Holy crap, crap. This is really happening to me that I am now going to be charged a pet cleanup fee. And they're also going to have more, more issues because you're violating my, you know, my, my safety and my security. So, all right. So here folks, what can you do about it? Right. You, you're going to, if you're going to use these Airbnbs and Verbos, no problem. Just be aware of it couple steps. Forrest mentioned the most important step is unplug the Wi-Fi. Uh, and if you need the Wi-Fi, that's understandable. But here's what typically happens. When you unplug that Wi-Fi, the host may end up calling you and saying, hey, uh, why did you unplug the Wi-Fi? And he may or may not say it, but hey, did you know all the cameras are are hooked up into the Wi-Fi network and that's how we spy on you? So that that's one step you can take. Another step that's recommended is taking photos upon arrival. I know that you, you have the photos from the website, but you should also take your own photos of all the rooms and be looking for things that look out of place. What, what are some other steps for us? Um, looking for things like infrared LEDs. Ah, yes. Um, sometimes you can you can see these on a camera um, that you wouldn't normally be able to be able to see. Uh, they'll they'll activate under low light conditions. Um, so yeah, if you can if you can take a camera around and and look for that uh, flood of infrared light, um, that's that's a good one. So close all the curtains is one way to do it and then turn on the flashlight on your phone or bring a flashlight and shine it around and look for that red light. That'll help you identify where it's at You're in the environment. Yeah, yeah. And, and also just, I guess, uh, getting a little more familiar with the different types of uh, you know, uh, hidden surveillance devices, whether it's cameras or microphones. Uh, I mean, these things can be uh, hidden in, in all kinds of stuff. Uh, what looks like a normal phone charger, like you mentioned, the smoke detectors. Yeah, I've seen alarm clocks. Alarm on clock, that. yeah. Yep. Um, I would also mention, I saw one the other day on Amazon. It's a camera that was inside of a screw. Okay, they actually sell them on Amazon now. $16 wow. 
for this camera that's inside of a screw. So it's a challenge for you to stay ahead of what are the newest types of, uh, of cameras. The other thing that you can do is get a bug detector, and that's like $49. It's a oh, worthy yeah. investment, uh, and they do work. They're RF detectors. They'll look for that stuff in your environment, but that's only half the story. You still have to do these other activities uh, in your in your host in environment. So Yeah, and, and a lot of this is also assuming that these devices are operating over Wi-Fi. Some of them can just operate and record to an SD card yeah. for, for oh. review later. So, I mean... Yeah, it's a it's a it's a battle. That's for it sure. It is for sure. That is our presentation. Please comment on what you think, especially the Airbnb stuff. I know there's got to be people out there that are just that are seeing that kind of stuff. Have you ever experienced that where you found a camera in your environment? We'd love to hear it. So uh, hit the hit the like button, Forrest. What else? What about your soapbox? If you like that, maybe subscribe, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If uh, if you want to get uh, some more of me ranting down the road, I'm I'm sure <laughs> it'll come up again. I'm yeah. sure. Uh, we do this CE threat intelligence email subscription. You can find it on our website. We are Security Metrics, and we try to help businesses with a finding affordable and high quality and simple to use data security compliance and cyber security tools. And that's our show. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, take care. Yeah, we hope you learned something.